I take a step back and I would say, what do you need a tool for? What are your biggest business problems, marketing problems, marketing use cases where you think you have an AI use case or you have an opportunity where AI might be able to assist you? So then we go through and we say, okay, where in this process do we spend a lot of time? Do we spend a lot of money? Is it a heavy lift? Is there a skill gap? Is there a knowledge gap? All of these different things. And is there an AI tool that can help me do this? So then we rank it. What's the value to intelligently automate that part of the process? And what's the, is there an ability for us to do that? So is there a tool available even? Um, what's the cost of that tool? Is it a heavy lift for us to onboard it? All those sorts of things. And you rank order that. And what we've realized is the things that surface as the most important on that spreadsheet are oftentimes not the things that we think we should be using AI to do. Hey everybody, today I'm so excited to be joined by Kathy McPhillips. If you don't know Kathy, she is the Chief Growth Officer at the Marketing AI Institute, overseeing marketing growth, customer experience, including Macon, their conference, and AI Academy for Marketers. Kathy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to finally make this date happen. Oh, so excited to talk to you. So backstory, a friend of ours who's also been on the show, Katie Robert, told us that we had to meet each other. And we finally got the chance when we went to the Macon conference this past July. And what an amazing conference it is. But we got to meet, we got to chat. And yeah, you're just one, one cool person. So I'm excited to have you today. Well, likewise. It was, it was like we had like, what? <laughs> So I'm glad we made it happen. Yeah, so glad we made it happen. So you've been in marketing, either owning agencies or working for agencies, including Content Marketing Institute for the past 18 years. So I'd love to just start out by you kind of describing like, what has that journey been like? Like, it sounds like you have all of this amazing experience. You worked for all of these huge brands that we all know and love as marketers. But tell me what it's been like for you personally. It's been really fun. You know, right out of college, I knew I wanted to get into advertising and I started an agency in Cleveland and it was like, it was in the heyday. It was in the um, early to mid nineties and it was a little bit of Mad Men. One of my first days at work, I walked upstairs to talk to one of the account execs and he had his feet on his desk and he was smoking a cigarette. And I was like, oh, this is, this is what advertising is. And I realized that was not the norm. But um, I loved it. I loved being with clients. I loved solving problems. I loved being their partner. And then I went, went to another agency. And then I realized that I kind of liked doing my own thing. And that pivoted me into having my own business for a while. And a little bit of that was um, necessity for my family. Mm -hmm. um, but I grew and grew that um, actually through a lot of my former teammates at the agency as well as clients. So I was very, very fortunate to kind of have this inbound funnel of folks who trusted me with their work. And then yeah. I met Joe, and then I met Joe Polizzi actually on Twitter and I was doing some consulting for them and I ended up going with him full time about 4 months after he was one of my clients. What an amazing person to kind of learn under their tutelage, right? I mean, like what what would you say for those of you who don't know Joe Polizzi? He I don't think he has now since sold it, I believe, right? CMI. Yes, he did. Um, he sold CMI in 2016 okay. um, and then has started another company, which he has since sold as well. <laughs> yeah, he's he's amazing in yeah. short. Um, and he used to own Content Marketing Institute. So, I mean, if you could describe what you learned from Joe, like what's the biggest thing you think you learned from working with him? Well, he's a, still a good friend of mine. We see him quite frequently. And I always say to him, like, you have ruined content for me because I have such high expectations on how people should be writing, creating, distributing content that, which is awesome. You know, we, I, I want to make sure that everything we're doing is meaningful. It's consistent. It's relevant. You know, all the things he defines as content marketing. So he really has made me realize that some of the things I was doing prior with some of my former clients that I was calling content marketing, I look back and I was like, nope, that was advertising. Uh, me writing a blog post, promoting my product or talking about us isn't content marketing. So he really made me realize the necessity and the value of the content that we're creating. Yeah, I think that's a valuable lesson that some people still need to learn. So we might have to have you back on another episode to theorize on what content marketing is and isn't. 
well, so fast forward to today, you're at AI Marketing Institute, which if you don't know AI Marketing Institute, I would be very surprised because all the chatter, at least this year for sure, has been about AI. Now, can you just kind of clue us in, for those of you who, who don't know you or don't know the Institute, what kind of clients do you serve there? Uh, we are not officially an agency. We are really focused on making um, AI approachable and accessible for marketers and business leaders around the world. So most of the folks that come through the Institute in the form of attending our event or coming to our AI Academy for Marketers um, are brands and agencies looking to figure out how to augment their work using artificial intelligence, is being responsible, being ethical, being thoughtful, making sure they're doing it the right way, and figuring how to augment their work, how to pivot their agency offerings, how to enhance their agency offerings using AI. So it's a lot, um, we're a media company, we are an event company, and we are an online education company. So through these, through those three things, we're really focused on helping marketers and business leaders do better work. And what amazing work it is. I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about AI a lot on the show already, and you can just tell, like it's at, at the top of mind for everyone right now. Um, but let's back up a little bit because I want to go into, you know, you've, you've had about three decades in the marketing field and it feels like I only have a slightly over a decade, right? But it feels like a lot of the fundamental shifts that we've seen or I've seen, and you've seen even more, um, has us as marketers needing to achieve more with less. <laughs> Do you find right. that to be true? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and how do you, how did you during your journey and all of the different roles and hats that you've worn, how do you, how do you keep doing that? How do you keep achieving more with less? So I, I look back on, and I did this in my presentation at uh, Marketing Puffs a few months ago. I talked about how when I was in advertising in the 90s, Applebee's International was one of my biggest clients or was my biggest client. And I was tasked with working with my uh, head and head of media to work on Applebee's first broadcast TV buy. And it was how much TV can we be on? How many weeks of mass media can we produce and afford for this client? So it was this big, long process. We did all the stuff, but we were on, you know, 16 weeks a year or whatever it was from a national perspective. And it was like, we are so proud of that. Except then when we saw the spot that was produced in from the creative team in a silo, didn't come to media, didn't ask us what we were looking for, didn't ask what programming we were on. And we watched it and we're like, oh my gosh, that is literally the worst commercial I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I'd rather take our money and throw it away versus run this spot. And we laughed about it and it was tough, but I'm like, how does this even get approved? But it was how much money can we spend? How much broadcast can we be on? And then once you buy it, you're stuck, you know? And over the years, it's been, you know, through digital, and then through social, and then through all the things we're doing today, we have the ability to test things. We have so much more data being able to use digital versus, you know, outdoor or, which is still very valuable in its own right, but um, shifting from into broadcast or digital and then into social and everything else and the paid media we're doing, we can better analyze everything. We can better figure out what's working and what's not working. And if something's not working, you stop doing it. And we have that ability now to iterate, to optimize, to stop something, to be creative and to test some things where we just didn't have that before. So I think that's the biggest benefit I've seen. And we're spending a fraction of what we were spending before. Our, our money is getting put toward other things, being more creative, being more strategic, using agencies in different ways than we were, than we were before. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think what I'm hearing you say, which is something I say all the time, is like everybody runs around saying like scale, scale, scale. We have to scale, right? And I'm like optimize, optimize, optimize. Yes. You can't scale until you optimize. And I feel like that's what, what you're kind of alluding to. Like we have this opportunity now. We can tweak the little minutia inside of things so much more easily to get the most bang for our buck. Absolutely. And just being able to target and personalize and not exhaust yes. our subscriber list. You know, we're doing that a lot with our emails right now because we have so much going on. And, you know, before we were trying to figure out, okay, we're doing sending a message to our subscribers with this message one day and this message the next day. And we're like, no, let's send it both on the same day, but put segment the list based on their preferences, their activities, their engagement, their lead score, all these different things now that we have a better ability to do and to make sure they're getting the right message to them at the right time. 
Yeah, I think that's such a valid point too. Like we say, it used to be the right content to the right person at the right time. And I think now, what, what, you know, speaking of hyper, uh, personalization, like you said, I think we have hyper personalization because it's the right content to the right person at the right time on the right channel, which right. by the way, is their channel of choice. Correct. Do they want that email or do they want to see it on social? Do you know, are they signed up for your newsletter or were they read, read I mean, I'm sure there's not anybody who wants a call, not me anyways, please don't call me, just send me a text. But maybe there are people who want text instead of, you know, email or something. So that's a really valid point that you have there. And, and we see it among our own team, you know, with our podcast, for example. I watch, I listen to it on Spotify. Mike listens to it on his podcast app on his phone. Tracy watches YouTube. And that's just three people who, by definition of, you know, if you were looking at our at our demographics and psychographics, it would be that we come up on the same list and we're doing it three different ways. So having the ability to have all this data and know the nuances and know the, um, even the anomalies of things like why are the three, three people who are, you know, fit into this bucket, why are they all doing it a different, a different way? And with AI and with other technology, we have the ability to see those things that the human eye just wouldn't catch. Yeah. I love that. So let's talk about situation where, some of us are in now, right? Or at least a lot of our clients have been uh, for the past couple of years, if I'm being quite honest, budgets are getting slashed, right? They're on budget freezes, they're on hiring freezes, resources are limited. How did you navigate those times in your positions and what key decisions did you make that ensured that the deliverable was still there, even though you were doing more with less? I think the biggest thing, you know, I kind of alluded to it before was just making sure that we were getting the right message, the right content, the right offering to people at the right time and not trying to do, be everything to everybody. Because at different times, you know, we have this journey that we're sending our, our subscribers on and our community on where, um, and actually this came as a function of a lot of what you're saying. We had this big AI Academy for Marketers with all of this content in it. And when I started, I was like, this is amazing, except... I'm so overwhelmed by this. There's so many places I could start. I don't know where to start. AI is this big word that I'm not even sure what it means. And I didn't know what it meant, meant when I started with the company. But when I was diving in, it was like, this is a lot of stuff. So over the past couple of years, we've changed that pat journey from just like, here you go. Here's this all of this AI on a platter to we have an intro to AI course. We've got a piloting AI course. We're creating a scaling AI course. So we are taking these members on a, on a journey of their own and I have journeys over, you know, over an overused word. Genuinely, it's we're trying to help them do this in bite-sized chunks and manageable chunks on a path that we see as a really successful way for them to, to be doing this. So taking all of what we're doing, our products and services, and thinking about their minds and how they're doing it. And some of the, and that helped us realize that some of the things we were trying, we were thinking about doing weren't as important as worrying about what our customer was worrying about. We could think like, oh, this is so fantastic. But if it didn't impact our customer right then and there, let's put that on the back burner and focus on the things that are really going to make the biggest impact for them. Yes. Oh my gosh. So can we dig into that a tiny bit? I would love to know, like, how do you approach segmentation? Because it sounds like this is a, a important to you and a big thing that you've done. Um, but is it a segment of just like people who are new to AI? people who are, have been using it, but aren't experts. And then like those people who are like really good, but need to scale, like you said, or, or are there other segments that are happening in there too? Oh, there's so many segments. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of lead scoring in HubSpot. So we look at engagement scores, um, intent scores, and intent, there's one more. I'll, it'll come to me in a second. But we basically look at, have they attended a webinar? Have they registered for a webinar? Have they um, come to Macon? Have they have they done all of these different things? Have they come to intro an intro class? People have come to intro classes 10 times. It's the same class. So and, and that's not true. Every, we do it every few weeks and it does just because of the state of AI, things change regularly. Right. <laughs> so it is getting updated, but generally the core of the class has not changed in two years. Um, it's just the things we talk about every time does change. So what are they doing? What um, Where do we see an opportunity for them to take that next step. And it doesn't always need to be a paid step either. You know, we're looking at folks who, have you have you heard of the podcast? You know, like you've done all these things. Did you know we had a podcast that's free? Do you know we have this intro class that's free? So if they've done some things, 
we have put them in these buckets through our through lead scoring. And then we also have, you know, in our email database, if they're if they're new, they get a welcome email, they're on a nurture program through our through our email database. Um, and then we get into the weeds a little bit more depending on what we're trying to do. Have you come to Macon? Have you been on our Macon page? Have you you work for a company that someone came to Macon? So we can really get over <laughs> a little over analytical on some of those things, but it has also paid dividends. Um, yeah. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say one of the things I did we, we've done the past few years is through the lead scoring, uh, we have done individual outreach based on people's intent. What is the likelihood of the, that these folks are the perfect person to come to Macon, or, or you know they're so close to to signing up? What can I be doing? So we rank order that list and look at their lead score, rank it high to low, and it ended up being like a thousand and some people on this really 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 high intent list. So we sorted it, and then I started doing individual outreach to those folks, the least AI thing you possibly could think of. But I and I knew many of the folks because our community is growing and it's our Slack group is so active. And I'm reaching out to them saying, Brooke, oh my gosh, it was so great to see you at Macon last year. How's business going? How's Alec doing? Um, I don't know if you know that we saw Macon is happening next year. I'd love to talk to you more about it. We sold a ton of tickets that way, but I do, wouldn't have been able to do that successfully without the lead scoring to help me at prioritize who I should have been reaching out to. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like it's 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 segmentation lead scoring, <clears throat> my voice is trying to leave, and being the human, right? The human element is still important in what you're doing for sales, right? And that's so the you... favorite, absolute favorite part. You know, I yeah. want to use AI to help me do the things I love doing. And you can't, like, what I'm hearing you say is, which I think is the a lot of the mindset out there is, oh, we can use AI to be more efficient, to do more with less, to, you know, cut some of the team members or the overhead that we have. But for those of us who use AI in what we do, I think we know that that human element is, you just can't remove it from the equation to make it work. Correct. So yeah. let's talk about, you know, tools and platforms whether they be AI or not. Obviously, I know you do a lot with AI, but have you found any tools, old or new, that are not crazy expensive, but you get a ton of value out of? Like if somebody said, you can only have three tools as a marketer for the rest of your career, what would you say? Well, I think I'd take a step back and I would say, what do you need a tool for? What are your biggest business problems, marketing problems, marketing use cases where you think you have an AI use case or you have an opportunity where AI might be able to assist you. So on our website, we have this workbook that Paul created and it's a basic, pretty basic spreadsheet, but it goes through and it says, okay, for your podcast, you do the recording, you do, you know, and for our podcast, there's 13 steps that we do every single time. And because there are a few of us involved in that process, it's pretty detailed from a process standpoint to make sure that if I'm on vacation and Claire is stepping in or vice versa now that she's taken over a lot of that, that we know that here's all the things that need to get done. So then we go through and we say, okay, where in this process do we spend a lot of time? Do we spend a lot of money? Is it a heavy lift? Is there a skill gap? Is there a knowledge gap? All of these different things. And is there an AI tool that can help me do this? So then we rank it. What's the value to intelligently automate that part of the process? And what's the is there an ability for us to do that? So is there a tool available even? Um, what's the cost of that tool? Is it a heavy lift for us to onboard it? All those sorts of things. And you rank order that. And what we've realized is the things that surface as the most important on that spreadsheet are oftentimes not the things that we think we should be using AI to do. So a few years ago when I started and we were doing the podcast and our webinars, I asked Paul, I said, who is in charge of our podcast production and webinar production? He said, you. And I'm like, Awesome. I've never done that before. So he said, go to Descript and use the Descript tool and just learn it and you'll love it. And I tell you what, that I should be a part-time Descript employee because <laughs> I use it every single day. I can edit it. I can edit in it because in Descript, instead of having to delete the WAV files, I delete the text from the transcript. I'm like, I can edit videos. So it's wow. just, so that's one tiny, tiny part of it. Now we can regenerate voices. We can do, we can overdub voices with our own voices. We can adjust the sound, do all of these things that we weren't able to do before, either from a 
knowledge standpoint or a time standpoint or a budget standpoint, because we were sending our podcast out for someone else to produce, which took a few days, understandable. Yeah. Yeah. But now with the way our podcast is today, it's news focused. We have to have it out in 12 hours because if we wait 24 hours or 36 hours, it's obsolete to a degree. So the script has helped me a ton. And then one of the projects we just did was we just had to create a video that I had produced last spring that we wanted to update. And I was out of town and Tracy said, can you either A, record it before you go or B, I have an idea. Let's go into Descript and train Descript on your voice so we can update the video, just the parts of the video that are now obsolete. And one of them was like Maycon's coming up. And that was, sure, it made sense last spring, but I don't know if I'd want to put that message out in November. Right. You know? So I read this paragraph and we trained Descript on my voice. And then, and I kept turning my volume up my computer louder and louder. <laughs> and it was on all the way. And I was like, I mean, I can't really even tell that's not me. What? I know. That's bananas. It is bananas. It's a perfect word. <laughs> well, I'm trying to do that with 11 Lab, I think it's called right yes. now. Chris Very Penn turned small. me on to it. Yeah. And it's just not there yet. So maybe – and you're like the – hundredth person I've heard talk about the amazing things Descript does. So yeah. maybe I should try Descript and it'll be able to get my voice down. I have a very weird voice. I think the AI cannot figure it out. <laughs> this paragraph I read was like the craziest, wonkiest string of words. <laughs> oh, to like get like, all the nuance in kind yes, of thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. What a great idea. Okay. Well now... Now I'm off course, but <laughs> now that you have said these tools, and by the way, like I really will, I really am saying, and Descript, if you're listening, I have literally no affiliation with them, but would love to. Um, you're like literally the hundredth person that's told me how amazing this tool is. So now I'm going to have to go check it out. So let's talk about agency growth a little bit. So for any agency owners who are up and coming and with all the vast knowledge that you have, what is your top advice? on how they should think about scaling their agency proportionally increasing overhead and costs, right? So like scaling smartly instead of scaling quickly. I think I would probably start by looking past a lot of the generative AI things. I think that's, you know, ChatGPT. It was a year ago tomorrow, actually, ChatGPT, yeah. or, you know, when I was, with, last November uh, that ChatGPT came out. And it, it was really a great entry point for a lot of folks to say, oh, that's AI. I, I'm not afraid of that. I see what it can do. But I think I think Chris Penn would say the same thing. I think he's said it before. This is the easiest way. You know, we're trying to have AI help us with the easiest part of marketing. Not that writing is by any stretch easy. But if you look at the data, the mounds and mounds and mounds of data that we have, the, the human could never, ever, working 24 hours a day, could ever process and analyze well. And AI is able to do that for us. So it can boil it down to a manageable data set, to something that we actually can use, analyze, grow from, learn from, et cetera. So I definitely would look at the side the, that side of things. And again, I'm not trying to say you need to get rid of your data, your data team, but how can they be be more efficient in what they're doing and how can they be using their analyst brains and not just their number crunching computer brains to do things better for you and for your clients. I look at that. I'd also, you know, generative AI certainly is a, is a place for um, agencies to consider, you know, if you're writing a lot of content for, for one of your customers, your clients, or for your own biz dev for your agency. But then there's that whole caveat of the U S copyright office says that, AI gener or cop generated by AI isn't copyrightable. So mm -hmm. you're using it for your clients. Do your clients know you're using it? What does your work for hire agreement say? Because if they think that you're writing it as a human and you're using AI, do your clients not own that copy? Because it does, according to US copyright law today, they don't own it. And that I think will change, but I think things will also be caught up in the legal system for so long that we mm -hmm. just need to, you know, do what it says right now. And then someone else asks, well, how will it, how will they catch us? And I guess that's probably a bad way to approach business in general. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, how will they catch us? I mean, I guess that's true in a way, but you know, to me, I forget who said it. It could have been Chris. Um, but somebody said, you know, at some point, you know, people are going to all be using AI, generative AI, or whatever site it may be, chat, GPT, Bard, to write all this content. And so 
assumably what will start happening is that all of the content will start to sound the same because it's all being written by AI. And that while AI can help you with like sentence structure and, and cleaning things up and, and, you know, making things more pithy, which is what I use it for a lot, it will never have our experiences. Right. And so writing your experience um, into your copy, whether it's for your own brand and agency or for a client, like AI will never be able to do that. It doesn't have experience, right? It can pull from all over the web and whatnot. But again, it can't say like this one time we ran this marketing campaign, spending all this money and, you know, for Applebee's and <laughs> the creative was terrible. <laughs> you know, that's a story or an experience that AI wouldn't be able to input into the content. Right. And it just goes to show you, and I don't think everything will sound exactly the same. If we're all using gener different generative AI tools, I can put in a prompt, you can put in a prompt, Paul can put in a prompt, and we'll get different different responses. However, I do think this is the opportunity for the humans to really show how valuable they are because we are adding our flair. We are adding our experiences. We are adding our voice to everything that we're doing. So the people that pump out AI using generative AI tools and just publish it as is verbatim, and don't check it. It could be wrong. It could be, you know, factually incorrect. And if they're just cutting and pasting, for sure, those are the same people that were pumping out content before using any other tool. They're just trying to get, you know, it's that content, you know, Mark Schaefer talks about it. It's that content overload or whatever the word is. I can't think con content shock. It's just yeah, like content shock. You don't need all this stuff. You just need really, really valuable stuff. And if AI can assist you with that, absolutely. But yeah. don't use, that's not a don't use that crutch to do everything that you're trying to get done. Um, so I could talk about that for the next hour. Well, let's hit on the data point a little bit because that's really how we're looking at using AI is through um, like predictive modeling mm -hmm. and taking large amounts of uh, data uh, specifically for us, like conversational data that happens on social for our clients and mining that data to say things like, um, um, you know, when, when we, you use these words, the sentiment score is usually 10 points higher, you know, when you answer a support question or when you give this promo code, um, along with this, you know, sentiment level of a conversation, you're 10 times more likely to close the deal. So tell us a little bit more about how to use, like what's some of the most clever ways you see companies using data and AI to succeed. Yeah, so there's a couple of tools that come to mind. One is brand ops, and brand ops me measures sentiment based on you, your, you know, your socials, your competitors, and can kind of pinpoint some things. Again, I think one of the king things I'll keep saying is it's just doing things that humans don't have the time to do because they're just able to do it so much faster. And like you said, it's pulling out some nuances that the human eye might have completely overlooked. So brand ops is really good at building out that sentiment, that score compared, you know, you compared to your competitors and it um, level sets just so you're like, okay, I really like what they're doing. I like what's working for them. How can we incorporate that? Not steal it. But how can we incorporate what they're doing into what we're doing so we can make sure what we're doing is even better. And then when I talked about the lead scoring before, there are tools like Akio and Mad Kudu that can, you know, when we do our lead scores. What we're doing is we are going through and we are manually creating a lead score in HubSpot where we are saying, if they did this, this many times, if they did this one, if they clicked on this page, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a very manual time consuming process where if we used one of these other tools and we said, here, here's our goal, here's what we are trying to achieve. It could build it for us. And then we go in and we change it. We don't, you know, again, we just don't take it at face value. We proof it, we check it, we edit it if we need to check it, but it gives us that really solid starting point so we can invest the time doing the things we like doing. And I think that's, again, something that we say a lot is to, it doesn't need to take this off your list. It just needs to um, think how more strategic we could be if instead of us spending four hours in HubSpot clicking on all these things, we could spend the output of the, spend the time looking at the output of that and doing something more meaningful with it. I couldn't agree more. We also use, is it Accio, 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 which is AI predictive modeling essentially. Right. And if you just go to their website, we'll make sure I link uh, all of these tools that we've been talking about in the show notes, which happen on YouTube. So if you are listening and not watching when this comes out, head over to YouTube and that's where the show notes are. And we'll link these tools there. But 
Accio is so cool for the predictive modeling. Um, if you go to their website right on their homepage, they have kind of a, a use case and an example. And it, I'll give the real quick backstory. It was a company who was trying to figure out why do people stay with us or why do people leave, right? So they had all of this data on their employees, you know, how long they were there, their title, their salary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they thought, obviously, because this would be my guess too, people stayed because of title and or salary. But what they found using Accio and predictive analytics was that people who had received, I want to say it was like 15 hours or more of training were like, you know, 10x more likely to stay or something like that, which is amazing because it's taking our gut and it's saying like, you're wrong, which a lot of times marketers use. But also if they would have sent a team of data scientists in to, you know, try to figure out this information, they may have never figured that out, right? <laughs> So. It's interesting. One thing that we uh, are looking at right now, we were talking about this as our team with our team is we've been doing these blueprints where it's AI for manufacturing marketing, AI for financial services marketing, AI for higher higher education. So we're trying to make sure that when we're sending out um, emails to our subscribers, we just say, okay, well these folks are in manufacturing, they're the perfect people to download this list. Great, of course they are. But how many agency folks are in our database that are in our database listed as professional services marketing and may have 10 ma manufacturing clients? Who have those clients? Yeah, me. We have a bunch of manufacturing so, clients. Yeah. But if we could tell from previous history and what you were doing that you were clicking on those pages or things like that, that how much better would that be? For us to make sure that we're providing you because like you're like awesome i have these clients i would like a little bit of a, an assist if i can to help me do even better work for them but yeah. we wouldn't know that if we just use the regular rules right right fascinating so in your experience how do you strike the balance of or between i should say being efficient and being effective right so doing things right and doing the right things like how does that play out for you now in, in all of your experience and the journey that you've had? How do you look at, you know, efficiency or being effective? Uh, I think right now, so I'll give you just a real life example that's happening this week is that part of my job is I'm focusing on building our academy. So building piloting AI, building scaling AI, or not building that necessarily, Paul and Mike are doing the production work on that. And Tracy, I'm doing, you know, how can we get this, the word out to all of our members that we have this new course coming up, et cetera. But I'm also a part-time agent for Paul and Mike and myself when we're out speaking. So I'm negotiating contracts. So I'm trying to figure out how do I take my time? How do I look at revenue? How do I prioritize what's going to be the biggest, it's going to have the biggest impact today. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to run our community with two other folks who recently joined our team who are amazing, but everyone still knows me as that point person. So I'm trying to do all these different things but ultimately, I want to make sure, yes, revenue is critical to our company. We're running a business. But if I take a, if I don't do, if I don't jump into the community and Slack every single day, people check in with me <laughs> and say, are you okay? Where have you been? What's going on? So part of the reason I love my job is because I'm focused on marketing and I'm focusing on growth of the company. But my heart is in with um, our customer experience. Yeah. My heart is with our community. So I know that with that naturally will come revenue. Um, and it's, I can't lose my connection with, with those people. So that's how I spend my, a, a lot of my time. So I'm trying to find tools that can help me do things, produce the podcast faster, uh, more and, and still get the same excellent result. I'm not going to, you know, do a okay job with the with the podcast because I have tools that can help me. I still want the same result. But if it can help me be more efficient, absolutely. So it's really trying to figure out, can I use some AI tool to help me generate uh, contracts faster for speaking so I can to go over there and do what I want to be doing? So that's really how I, I try to prioritize my usage of AI tools, me being efficient with those things so I can really focus on being effective and growing the business the way that is the right way to grow a business. Yeah, yeah. I heard that at Maycon, actually. Um, this was a great piece of advice that I took away from Maycon, which was, you know, if you do find these efficiencies that AI can come in and do, the take that time that you get back and invest it in the human side, invest it in your team or in your clients, right? Because 
ultimately, I think those of us who are into CX, which you and I both are, know that the money comes from that, that personal connection with your clients and your internal team too, like so culture. Um, but yeah, I think I, to me, the, that's what I heard you say, right? Like even where you find these efficiencies and you get these hours back, reinvest those hours in the community or the customers or the internal team or all of the above. Right. And, you know, and two things, one, Paul has even said before, or you could just close your computer and go outside. You know, you don't have to be <laughs> invested with more work. You know, we're so busy. Work is never going to end. We're healthier and we're happier if we can disconnect and get away from our computers for a while. And why can't we let AI be that, that thing that helps us achieve that? Yeah, that's a really good advice. That's something I would have a hard time taking that piece of oh, advice, but, it's, but I need it. I need it. <laughs> We give really, really good advice I don't take. Uh -huh. <laughs> me too. Um, well, you talked about the team a little bit. So tell me, you know, how do you maximize the output of your team? So you're kind of getting people in place right now. And what happens when, let's say, you know, you're on that budget freeze, like you have to make it work with what you have today. What strategies or approaches have you used in the past or recently that you found to be most in effective in training your team, motivating your team, but also doing more with less? <laughs> right. Well, interestingly, Claire, so Claire and Noah started in September and Claire has now taken over the, the bulk of the podcast production. And I looked at her and I said, tear this apart. Like if you find something, oh, I've been doing this for, you know, two and a half years. If you find something that you're like, why does she do it this way? Or there's such a more efficient way to do it. I go, <laughs> no ego to fix it, make it better, find other tools. Just because I'm doing it this way doesn't mean it's the right way. So giving her the ability to you know, make her mark, find some things, be creative. And she's loving it, which is awesome. Like she has this just drive to learn and to grow. And I'm so happy that she does. And same thing with Noah, you know, he's looking at ways we can improve the event and I'm like find some tools that can help you do that. Um, and then another thing we're doing, and we're doing with this with our team next week is we have these things called hackathons where we're all sitting in the room and for piloting AI that we're launching in January or for Maycon 2024, we look through here's the 50, 70, whatever the number is, things that we do every single time we have an event from email one, email two, all the way through email 15 or whatever, however many we run over the course of the year to paid advertising, to changing the header hat on our uh, website every you know few weeks to mix up the messaging, to writing a press release, all these different things. We write them all out. And then we have these meetings where we're all sitting there and we're like, well, have we ever thought about delivering packages for, to companies in Cleveland, walking them and you know having them come to the event or just off the wall crazy ideas and giving our team, enabling our team to have those crazy ideas, whether or not we execute them. Because you know, of the 20 crazy ideas, one might really be amazing or one might really think have us think about something else that we hadn't thought about. So allowing ourselves that time to be creative. And Robert Rose taught me that a long time ago when I was at CMI that I forget what the number, it wasn't 80, 20, it might've been 90, 10, but whatever it was is like block off some time each week to have those crazy ideas and see if any of them work. And I actually have told Claire and Noah, I said, I don't know, Friday mornings, Friday afternoons, when things are kind of winding down or you just need a brain break, block off, block it off on your calendar on a weekly basis and just allow yourself the time to go out and, test out a new tool or, you know, any of those things. And we're really lucky at, at our, at our company, because if we want to try out something new, unless it's sharing sensitive data or something like that, we have the leadership team. that's like, yeah, please. Cause our customers want to know that too, yeah. but having that freedom and to, to just play around with some things and experiment and see what comes up. Yeah. I love that. I think you have to make a culture of, you know, the crazy ideas, like even if nothing comes about it, right? Like everybody has some sort of idea. And especially like, I think about it, like our frontline people, right? The community managers who are, are doing the social care, they know way more than I do. So right? I'm always wanting to talk to them because they see it, they are in it, they live it every day. I'm, you I, know, the visionary in the scary. background, but it's not, it's not the same, right? You have to have those frontline people kind of feeding that information back to you on what they see. So, and the night, you know, one thing I to also talk to your teams about is that just because there is an AI tool that can help you do that doesn't mean you have to use it. 
it doesn't mean that AI needs to replace that part of what you're doing. Uh, Paul, me, Tracy, a few other team members, we're journalism majors. We are strong writers. We enjoy writing. We don't use generative AI to write our blog posts, to do a lot of the things that other folks are using Gen AI for. And that's okay. Right. You know, um, so it's just something to keep in mind that just because some AI can do something for you doesn't mean you need to, to do it. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Yeah. So let's go back to the personal note about both of us not taking our really good advice. So you've been in these high pressure environments for it's years, for years now. now. Um, what do you do to ensure that while we're all doing more with less, that you achieve that in your daily life as well, right? How do you do more maybe with less time? How do you ensure that your routine allows you to remain on top of your game outside of work? Yeah, this is not my biggest strength. I'm really good at not shutting down and unplugging and I've been trying to get better, but it's still, I still have a long way to go. And I think part of that is the function that I've, I worked from home since before it was cool. I've been working from home since, ni since 99. Nice. So it's very easy to not close your computer when you're working in the place that you're working all day long. So, but I do think when it, when it, when it boils down to it, and this started way back in Applebee's days when things were crazy and clients were high, were demanding and all these things were happening. I don't mean to keep bashing Applebee's. They were an amazing client. And one of my best friends I still talk to on a regular basis. We texted this morning already is we're like, it's just, we're trying to sell riblets. Like we're not trying to change the world with Applebee's, you know, or any of your clients. It's like, this can wait a minute. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some things, obviously we're in a very, very fast paced industry. We have clients who need things. We have customers who need things. Absolutely. We can, you know, do all that during the day, but if something is there, there shouldn't be as many crises as we think there are. And it's okay just to stop for a minute and catch your breath. And I just recently got back from a 11 day trip out of the country with some of my girlfriends. And I came back Monday and I was like, I'm ready to do this because I had, I didn't take my computer with me. I didn't take my security blanket with me to Italy. And it was like, at first I was like, I can't leave without this. But then I, I quickly was fine. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I just came I, back to refresh and recharge. And when I was at CMI, Pam Putsey, who headed up operations, we went to um, the Outer Banks with my family, my kid, my husband and my kids and some friends. And I logged into my email one day and I checked my email. And the next day, my email, I, I couldn't get in. And I was like, oh my gosh, did I just lose my job? So I texted Pam and I said, I can't get into my email. She's like, yeah, I changed your password. She's like, you're on vacation. You are no good to me if you come back exhausted. Go rest. Um, and it was like, okay, that's so yeah. true. Yeah. And that's exactly the type of leadership we need. I'm like you. I'm my own worst enemy. So like I have to leave the phone or leave the computer at home sometimes and just go outside or do something all day without my phone. And yeah, for the first like two hours, I'm like, oh my God, what if something happens? <laughs> <laughs> but then by the end of the day, when I get back and I check my phone, nothing happened. And if it did, it's nothing so pressing that it can't wait till Monday, right? So I love that advice. We Sometimes we have to give ourselves a little tough love or hope that we have leaders like Pam who give you the tough love for yourself. So last question, I know there are going to be people who want to connect with you, who want to know more about what you do. So what are you working on? Where can people find you? Where do you hang out? Or if you do hang out on digital channels? Well, mostly I'm on LinkedIn at this point of my life. So I'm just Kathy McPhillips on LinkedIn, really easy to find. Uh, I do post a lot of AI stories and things I'm tinkering with and trying and things I hear from others. So hopefully it's useful. I did see some, one of my friends last night and he's like, hey, LinkedIn queen. And I was like, I don't need that. I don't need that title. But thank you. Thank you for it. He's like, and I was like, oh my gosh, am I so annoying? He's like, no, it's actually helpful. I'm like, perfect. That's yes, what I'm I would agree. Um, and Marketing AI Institute, we are just at marketingaiinstitute.com. And if you are not familiar with the Institute, I would recommend two free places to start. Uh, Paul and Mike do an awesome podcast that is very excellently, excellently produced and it's called the Marketing AI Show. And also we've got a free intro to AI for Marketers class. It's 35-ish minutes of Paul talking about the definition of AI all the way through, all the way through on how to, how to get started, how to start thinking about things. It's really, really useful. And the second 25 minutes of that hour is 
Paul and I talking, I'm fielding questions from the community and from attendees. And it's one of my favorite things to do every few weeks. It's a great resource, great free resource for folks just to kind of start dipping their toe in the water. And it's nice sometimes people that aren't familiar or there are already doing a lot of things with AI, they come anyways. And it's a real good level set and framework, I think, for folks, even if people are, are already testing things out. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, Kathy, it's been so much fun to talk to you on the podcast today. I'm really excited about the things that you're doing. I follow her on LinkedIn, so I think you definitely should. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and experiences with us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much. This was fun. And I wore my green for you. Did you notice that? <laughs> I did. Thank you for being on brand. <laughs> <laughs>